Welcome back to another episode of AIDL Podcast, the podcast where I do weekly book reviews. This week, I read The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. by Peniel E. Joseph. This book was released in 2020, and it frames Malcolm X and Martin Luther King as their various representations of the sword and the shield during the civil rights movement. Also, how they fulfill the role of each other's political antagonist with their opposing preservation philosophies. They both ultimately strived and died for the recognition of Black dignity and Black citizenship that is ultimately promised by a democratic state that is America. This book also acknowledges the strategic development of Malcolm and Martin and the alliances that they formed for the greater good of Black people. Now, sometimes with historical figures, I like to go into the background of these people. However, we're going to talk about the empowerment lineage of both Malcolm and Martin. Now, Malcolm has a very interesting Um, empowerment lineage. So this starts all the way back with Booker T. Washington, who had this ideology of bootstrap racial uplift, which basically means nobody's going to help us. In fact, people are, you know, working against us, so we have to help ourselves. What happened is Booker T.'s ideology influenced Marcus Garvey, who was one of the main figureheads of the Great Migration back to Africa. Garvey's movement directly impacted Malcolm's parents and um, influenced their ideologies. And Malcolm's uh, dad, Earl Little, became a major part of UNIA, which is the Universal Negro Improvement Association. So Malcolm grew up around all of this. So you can imagine you know, all of these different ideas kind of shaping him in his formative years. And when he became incarcerated, when he was um, in adulthood, he was introduced to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. And ultimately, I guess a, a better kind of structure for his life. And he took full advantage of that. And we see the first iterations of his leadership with his advocacy for Muslims in jail and how he, you know, spoke up for them and said that they needed certain things for prayer or, or they couldn't eat certain things or whatever may have you. But this is where we see Malcolm, you know, kind of testing out being a leader. And of course, once he um, got out, he got heavily involved in the Nation of Islam, which impacted and formed his later adult years. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. has a different lineage, but in the same time, kind of similar to Malcolm X's. So his maternal grandfather was Pastor A.D. Williams, who influenced MLK Sr., who was called Daddy King. And they called Daddy King a leading race man, which basically meant that he was someone who everyone in the community knew was for the betterment of black people and better treatment of black people. And you have to understand that MLK was raised in the South. So they saw, you know, a lot of terrible, overt racist things. Ebenezer Baptist Church was the home church of the King family. This is the beginnings of his career as a pastor, but he also went to Crozier Crozier Theological Seminary where he was further educated in um, religion, but also he got a better awareness of race relations and the world. So these two men were influenced by their familial lineage, but also the ideologies of the people that came before them and the structure of religion. And that's very important. And we're gonna touch on why that's so important later on. Now let's talk critical players. So there's a lot of people that were influential, impactful, important, imperative to the civil rights movement. We're only gonna hit on a few and not just people, organizations as well, but I wanted to touch on this because oftentimes when we're taught, if we're taught at all, 
in school about the civil rights movement were taught basically about MLK and Rosa Parks. And that's not all that, you know, happened here. But first, let's just get into a little bit of Peniel E. Joseph's uh, background. So, you know, I was kind of surprised that he wasn't a journalist because I always say that journalists write the best books because you know their references are on point. It's very informative. You know, they're giving you all of the information, the dates, you know, the context, all of that. But he has roots in academia. So at the University of Texas in the LBJ School of Affairs, he is an associate dean of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. He is a founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, and he is a chair in the Ethics and Political Values um, Department. So, you know, this just goes to show that he's very aware of what's going on in, in the different um, the different themes of this book. He's very well educated. You, you know, he obviously is teaching at a higher learning institution, and his points are well thought out, well referenced. I mean, he has all of the references in the book, but also I do want to say throughout this review, feel free to Google any of these events or these people because you can still look up um, newspaper articles from this time period. Thank goodness for the web because they have all of it basically archived and most of it you can access for free. Some stuff you may have to pay or like a subscription or something like that. But um. All of these events are well documented and you have access to it. And if it's not on the web, you could probably find it at your local public library. So just a, a shout out there. <clears throat> now, Malcolm X is a mobilizer, religious based, and he's for black liberation. He is described as black America's prosecuting attorney. He's also described as the political sword. And his whole thing is black dignity by any means necessary. MLK is also a mobilizer. He is also religious based and for black liberation. He is described as black America's chief defense attorney. He's the political shield who is really into nonviolence for the long-term advancement of black people. Now, when we're talking about key players here, let's get into the big five. So these are the, the big five organizations within the civil rights movement. So these probably sound a little familiar to you. The NAACP, the National Advance, the, oh, sorry, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was founded in 1909 with prominent members, including W.E.B. Du Bois and I.W. I. Wells. So, um, the point I wanted to make here was that this was founded well before the civil rights movement began. Same with uh, CORE, which is the Congress of Racial Equity, ugh, Equality, which was founded in 1942. The Urban League, which provided assistance to black people, was founded in 1911. These organizations were already there and they were already providing black people with uh, access to a greater movement that they didn't know existed at that time but we do have SNCC and SCLC now SNCC the student nonviolent coordinating committee was founded in 1960 and they really focused on organizing sit-ins and freedom rides SCLC is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference 1957 and their whole thing was desegregating schools the voting rights campaign and the March on Washington with MLK now, I do want to say that these organizations, generally speaking, most of them were founded with nonviolence uh, at the forefront in the beginning. We'll see towards the end of Malcolm and uh, Martin's deaths that this kind of changes slightly for some of them. But the point is, there were varying organizations who focused their efforts on different aspects of the civil rights movement and of black empowerment, and they all came together in some way um, for the betterment of people. Another key player is the Poor People's Campaign in 1968. This was MLK's attempt to connect economic and racial justice. Now, most of his final days 
were dedicated to planning the Poor People's March on Washington. And this is where we see that change that people don't often talk about when it comes to MLK. I wonder why. But his last few days were really dedicated to the Poor People's Campaign, and he was really focusing on the economic um, empowerment of Black people as well as, you know, getting rid of all these Jim Crow laws and things like that. The FNP, Freedom Now Party, in 1963 was a short-lived party, but it was politically aligned with socialism. Robert F. Kennedy, Robert, is it Robert F. Kennedy? Bobby Kennedy was the attorney general from 61 to 64, and he was more so the presidential contact for MLK when his brother JFK was president from 61 to 63 until he was assassinated and he had a very um advantageous alliance with MLK. I would say he he kind of used MLK at times um but you know when it comes to alliances you're using each other so we'll get more into that relationship in just a moment. James Baldwin an unexpected person you know to pop up here at least for me I always view him as someone, obviously a famous author and someone in the arts that meant a lot to black people. And I have to remind myself that during this time period, it didn't matter if you were rich or famous, if you were black, you were black, okay? And so it makes sense that we see figures like James Baldwin or Maya Angelou be, um, be included or... Um, be at these critical events because during this time period you know if you have some type of influence with the black community you want to be working for them and working to help black people as a whole get the the rights that they are um, required to have by the constitution but james baldwin knew both malcolm and martin and he wrote about them there's a couple quotes that we'll hear throughout this review and he's also a figure in some of these critical events he's in some of these meetings with the president which was surprising to me i don't know why um but yes so one of my favorite authors made an appearance in this book now also the nation of islam in a y so i'll either call them in a y or nation of islam and the nation was led by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad from 1934 until his death in 1975. Now, a critical player that we don't give enough credit to are the grassroots activists who didn't necessarily belong to one organization or another. These were just the regional community organizers that, especially in the South, were going down there, going door to door along these dirt roads, you know, organizing people for these protests or getting them registered to vote, um, they play a really big role here because when it came to if something happened, it was oftentimes those grassroots people who would bring in the cores or the or the SNCs or the SCLCs or who would be the contact for these um, events revolving around these unfortunate situations. So we got to give a lot of props to them. And it's it could be just, you know, random people in the community that just want to help. But they were really integral in getting people connected, especially in the South. J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. Let me just say something. To this day, they should be ashamed of themselves and what they did to contribute to the downfall of both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Now back to the review. So J. Edgar Hoover was the director of the FBI from 1924, when it was then, it wasn't called the FBI, but it was like an earlier iteration of the FBI until his death in 1972, which I didn't know. Like he held that director position for almost 50 years. How ridiculous. But they were instrumental in purposely sabotaging black empowerment groups, amongst other things. You know, they had their hands in other things, but for this book's purpose, they were agitators to the movement. Speaking of, let's talk Pro, the FBI program that disrupted socialist groups and prominently antagonized MLK. And when we say antagonize, what we mean is 
They would send him letters and packages, blackmailing him and encouraging him to kill himself. So this is the level of um, this is the the level of evilness that we're talking about here when we're talking the FBI in the fifties and the sixties. Now, our last few critical players here, MFDP, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, who challenged the Dixiecrats. The Dixiecrats were Democrats that were basically Southern Democrats that opposed, you know, integration and were blatantly racist. And so MFDP was formed um, in 1964 during Freedom Summer. Then we have LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, who was president. He took over after JFK was assassinated in 63. He held that position until 69. He signed the Civil Rights Acts of 64 and 68 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. And he was also in an alliance with MLK until the end of MLK's life. And another figure I didn't expect to see here, Stokely Carmichael. For whatever reason in my mind, I associate him more with the Black Panthers and I never really have associated the Black Panthers with the civil rights movement or with Malcolm and Martin at all. But there was some overlap there. So Stokely was also, he was actually a member of SNCC before he became a Black Panther in 1968. And he was the originator of Black Power of that saying. Now, critical events. So we talked about the players. Let's talk about the events that either mobilized change or served as a catalyst or an inspiration to people or, you know, served as basically movement in the right direction of the movement in general. Now let's talk Bloody Sunday. Bloody Sunday occurred in Selma. In March of 65, there was a... Um, protest that was organized and it was supposed to be a march from Selma to Montgomery and this was you know for the advocacy of voting rights well the state troopers in Selma decided that that wasn't going to happen on their watch and they brutalized these protesters it's called Bloody Sunday for a reason um it's horrific but it ultimately led to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 being signed by LBJ and with the critical events, I tried to pull out what, excuse me, what happened as a result of these events taking place. Now, the March on Washington took place in 63, and this was when JFK was still president. Um, this was a peaceful protest that was condoned by white liberals. The amount of people that showed out to the march was astonishing for the time period, and it also rekindled JFK's communication with Martin Luther King. However, it was criticized by Malcolm for being too performative and controlled by the White House because in his mind, he's thinking, um, you let the White House tell you when and where to protest. How is that a protest then? You know, it's too controlled. So there we can see his reaction to the March on Washington. And he also had a, another reaction to it, but we're going to touch on that in a different segment. Now, JFK was assassinated in 1963, in November of 1963, which inadvertently resulted in Malcolm's removal from the Nation of Islam. That was because Malcolm, you know, had criticized JFK a few times. And um, upon his assassination, he said the famous quote, you know, the chickens come at home to roost. And the Nation of Islam did not like that at all. So he was removed. But this also... Uh, gave entrance to Lyndon B. Johnson as the president. And that's where, you know, that alliance between MLK and LBJ started. Now, the Freedom Rides, uh, organized by CORE in 1961, another event that showcased the brutality towards peaceful protest protesters, um, these were students that took the bus and uh, purposely sat the black students in the front the white students in the back so they can you know oppose these absurd uh segregation uh laws and, and regulations in the south and they were they were brutalized basically it was terrible now this inadvertently ramped up the fbi's investigation into mlk they already were surveilling him but 
JFK, who was the president at the time, did not like the FBI's kind of lack of response to the Freedom Rides. What we'll see is when some of these events are critical because they embarrassed the nation they embarrassed and by the nation i mean america they embarrassed the white house okay this was one of those events that was so terrible and it was just students getting beat up for doing nothing for sitting on a bus really and jfk was just like you know appalled and so the reason it's critical is because it was so horrible but it finally got the white house's attention and forced them to do something speaking of Let's talk about Birmingham with Bull Connor. Bull Connor was a hardcore segregationist who was, he was like the police commissioner or police chief or whatever um, in Birmingham at the time. This is in 1963. He authorized the use of fire hoses and of um, police attack dogs to quote unquote control the protesters. But really what they were doing was again, brutalizing them. And this included women and children. And we see these pictures in the history books. I know when I was younger, we saw like the dogs that were barking at the kids for no reason. This resulted in MLK's arrest because he was there protesting as well. And he then released the letters from Birmingham. Now this improved MLK's uh, relationships with the relationship with the White House. It opened up that communication line because this was seen as like the epitome of a nonviolent protest you know these people weren't doing anything and they were attacked you know and again it embarrassed the White House and so it kind of forced their hand the next critical event was Malcolm X's assassination in 1965 what it did was it created a martyr um, Malcolm was legendary during his lifetime but it propelled to an even higher level after he was killed because it was like he was right like they you know they killed him for speaking on our behalf and so it cemented his legacy forever with the black community at least now his assassination radicalized stokely further because stokely was kind of already getting there and it also radicalized king now when i say radicalized from mlk i'm not talking about him taking a 180 but i'm talking about some of his you know his ideologies kind of started shifting towards the direction of Malcolm to give you a few examples so he described nonviolence as a peaceful sword he slightly aligned himself with the black power movement he started including reforming the economy under the umbrella of black empowerment which was a radical ideal for that time period he said that the protests that you know he was still sanctioning and holding and stuff had to be less aimed at hearts and minds and more based on power that can be leveraged i know i'm currently reading um the 48 laws of power there's one law that talks about how you can't really you know play or rely to people's sympathy or empathy because it's not really consistent and you can't count on that all the time and if you think about it that's what these nonviolent protests were doing they were counting on other people in america to be empathetic and obviously that only worked like some of the times so what mlk was saying was that okay we need to look at what we can actually leverage which that's the politics there that's the strategizing talking james baldwin was quoted as saying by the time malcolm and martin met their death there was practically no difference between them so after Malcolm's assassination, I think it really did impact MLK. And I, I never really thought about it before, you know, that MLK could be impacted in, in such a way after Malcolm was gone. But it did. It, it started moving him slowly towards what Malcolm was talking about. But what we'll see in another section is Malcolm had already started moving slowly towards MLK before he was um, killed. So... And the last critical event here is the Watts Uprising of 1965. So this is when King acknowledged that riots could be a form of protest. The reason this is a critical event is because it started to make white liberals uncomfortable and because it was alluding to violence as an acceptable tool, which is something that, you know, Malcolm X had said years before. And so it ruined a lot of the relationships and alliances that 
MLK had had throughout the years. And it strained, heavily strained his relationship with the White House and at that time, the President LBJ. Now, let's talk about the political mirror or the political reflection of Malcolm and Martin. So these are two seemingly opposing figures that are parallel on political paths. And so sometimes their their opinions directly related to each other and sometimes they were just very, you know, similar. So let's start with talking about the Afro-Asiatic and Indochina events that had happened directly before the civil rights movement in America. And this involved the English and the French removal from these areas. So between 1946 and 1954 was the first Indochina war. This was France versus the French colonies, which included Vietnam and a few other places. But the French ultimately lost and they had to withdraw after the Battle of Dien Bien Phu of 1954. And that was a big win for um, this so-called third world country, third world nation at that time period. And it, it influenced both um, Martin and Malcolm. Malcolm saw it as, you know, hey, look, if they can do it, we can do it type of thing. The, the anti-imperialist and anti-colonial movements, um, you have Mahatma Gandhi with the nonviolence and, and the passive approach and the third world resistance from these developing countries. So they, they both, you know, agreed with that sentiment. And then the March on Washington. So I talked about earlier how Malcolm had criticized the March on Washington, but privately, he agreed that it was, you know, a good idea to immobilize the city, basically, with all of the numbers that they had, all those people that were there, they really could, you know, disrupt the status quo. But again, in his mind, he felt it was poorly executed because it was too controlled by the White House. But here again, we see, you know, their opinions are very close to each other. It just wasn't exactly the same. Now, the JFK assassination, where I talked about how Malcolm said, you know, the chicken's coming home to roost. Well, MLK delivered similar sentiments towards the end of his life, but he delivered it with like a peace motif. Basically, they both kind of had an understanding that that was the culmination of the violence in America. You know, for them, they had seen their friends and, and fellow protesters and just black people in general being brutalized throughout the country. And so obviously, if you're a black person during this time period, you know America is violent. So why would it be any surprise that a president could be assassinated, you know? So that was kind of the sentiment that both of them had. And this is kind of in conjunction with the war in Vietnam. So there was this general anti-war um, rhetoric going with both of them. Malcolm was like, why would you fight for a country that hates you? And honestly, that is the most... That statement makes so much sense. I was recently rewatching Lovecraft Country, the HBO series, and one of the main characters, he's a black man, which is he came back from um, serving in Vietnam and he came back to, you know, the same segregated nonsense. And it's like, I guess I'm so upset because I'm looking at it from the lens that is 2023, where everyone's like, respect the troops, you know, whatever. But how can people back then be so stupid to disrespect a soldier that fought for you whether you agree with the war or not they were over there fighting and they come back home and they can't even enter you know the the front door to a restaurant and be served in the same manner like that's crazy to me like the mental gymnastics that somebody had to do to disrespect a person just for being black is crazy and i know like first of all it's not right to be racist period. But especially the soldiers that were fighting for a country that never treated them correctly, like that mindset is crazy. And I know it's like looking back on that, that was what, 70 years now. So I guess looking through the lens of perspective, I can see how completely asinine that is. But that was my, you know, tangent. But King also had similar sentiments on the war. He said war, racism and poverty are three areas where there has to be moral and spiritual progress. It, you know, like America has a problem with it. It's 
we got to fix it. And it's all racism, war and poverty. It's all, you know, encompassed in one. And this was kind of some of his later ideas in life. But really just understanding that there's violence in the country. Why wouldn't, you know, why, why, why is that blowing everyone's minds that it's like a president sitting in office can be assassinated? So they, they mirrored each other in that instance. Now they both were, like I said before, deemed black representatives. So Malcolm was the black Black America's prosecuting attorney. Basically, he was representing the black community in the criminal case of racism. And Martin was the black America's defense attorney. And he was basically defending black rights to white people. And he was defending white people's involvement in the movement to black people. And it's interesting because later in his life, um, Martin was also deemed the prosecuting attorney. So that just, again, goes to show you how close and ideals that they had became. And lastly, I found it interesting that they both had a, an awareness or an acknowledgement of their own mortality. So at one point in their lives, they both have said that, look, I'm probably going to die at the hands of this uh, movement. And I mean, it's such a violent movement when you look back on it that there's a level of strength that I don't think I'll ever understand when it comes to, you know, the pressure that these figures are under just leading a movement alone, but then dealing with stuff like Cointel Pro and the FBI. And it's just, I, I don't know how they did it. 